Hello and welcome to UCL Global Health. We're all very familiar with pictures on our TV screens of uh, hungry and malnourished mothers and children, usually in parts of Africa, and we're familiar with regular nutritional crises. I'm joined by Andy Seal, who is head of our research team in nutrition and crisis. So Andy, I mean, isn't this nutrition emergency, isn't it just about sacks of food? What's there to research about? It's a good question. I mean, that is perhaps quite a common conception that that is the main focus. And indeed, food aid is one of the largest components of a, any humanitarian response. But it's about more than that. It's about water, wash, uh, control of infectious diseases. Wash, you said. Sorry. Water and sanitation and hygiene. Right. Um, and so those sectors come together to create um, an environment which allows malnutrition to flourish or not. Um, and there's been an awful lot of innovations uh, in recent years. Um, and a lot of that has come from the research community. Yeah. Actually, you mentioned wash. Um... Am I right that more children die during acute emergencies from infection than actually the lack of food and starvation? Is it, is it both together? Yeah, it's, the malnutrition infection cycle is an right. important um, concept which helps explain why if children are malnourished, they're more likely to be infected, and if children are infected, they're more likely to become malnourished. So it's a vicious cycle, right. because it's very difficult to exactly dissect out the different proportions, but both are extremely important. Well, interestingly, the, the UN Secretary General released a report in May of this year, and they outlined three main challenges. One was the need for data-driven decision-making right. in humanitarian responses. Secondly, the need for better partnerships um, between the different actors, many of them new actors in the humanitarian system. Such as? Such as, for example, the increasing role of China as a donor rather than as a recipient of aid, for example. Mm. And as, as we all know, China is playing an increasingly important role in Africa. And then um, thirdly, um, he raised, raised the challenges of access in an increasing number of emergencies now. Uh, conflict um, is really um, preventing the access of humanitarian actors. But back to data, I mean, most of the situations where you find this is chaotic, there may be conflict, incredibly remote areas. How can you collect data? You can't do randomised controlled trials, surely? No, generally not, absolutely. Um, but are there new methods for getting data? Well, there's been a, a sort of general move to improve the methods for data collection. Um, with, of course, cross-sectional surveys uh, or surveillance are the two sort of main methods that are used. Um, and there's been a real move by something called the SMART Initiative and then UNHCR to improve methods for data collection in surveys just recently. And before that, of course, there's been a lot of work done by MSF and other agencies as well to improve methods and, and data collection. Do you, think, do you think things are getting better or worse? Um, in terms of data, I think things are generally getting better. Yeah. But it's constrained by going back to this issue around access, because if you can't get your people in to, to collect the data, then it's very hard to be sure about what's really going on. I mean, we're, we're reading a lot about the economy in Africa is really going up now in a lot of countries, and even in some of the poorest countries, you're seeing growth rates of five, five plus percent. Does that mean that nutritional status is inexorably improving and we're going to see fewer and fewer emergencies in the Horn of Africa, or, or am I painting too rosy a picture? As I see it, there's sort of two opposing forces. One is exactly that, that Africa and many other countries uh, around the world are developing very fast, which is great. Um, but of course, that will also lead to a increasing strain on natural resources, um, probably more competition between emerging superpowers and existing superpowers for resources. So probably more geopolitical conflict, I think, is, is likely as things move on. Then, of course, you also have the the 7 billion plus population, uh, which is increasing. Right. And then add to that the uncertainties around climate change. Yeah. I think um, nutrition in crisis is unfortunately quite a good profession to be in. Okay, and looking to the future, do you see any big new developments in the next few years? I think there will be an increase or a continued uh, process of innovation within the sector. There's been a lot of really interesting developments um, over the last 10, 15 years with the um, at-home treatment of severe acute malnutrition, right. for example, the development of ready-to-use therapeutic foods and others. Um, and I think that will continue. 
but I think also there's a there's a risk or maybe a need for, in my opinion, for humanitarian organisations to refocus on their on the principles of independence in action because there is an increasing um, trend for them to be influenced both by corporate sponsors and also by donors. You mean independence from political influence and uh, perhaps securities infiltrating humanitarian agencies as much as that? Well, that. Let's leave that Angelina Jolie film out of this, but um, I think, yeah, independence from the private sector, obviously the private sector is okay. an incredibly important uh, players and it's good to be involved um, very much with the expertise that they can bring. But uh, I think there perhaps has been a bit of a honeymoon period. And in terms of donors, yes, especially with the UN cluster system, um, there's perhaps a tendency for humanitarian organisations to be too closely aligned with the geopolitical agendas of member states of the UN. Andy, thanks very much. Thanks, Anthony.